in the landscapes of Omaha, Nebraska, amidst the echoes of Black Tuesday, a phoenix rose from the economic ashes. This phoenix was none other than Internorth, born in 1930, fueled by the Great Depression's low gas prices and a surplus of labor. Little did the world know that this unassuming beginning would set the stage for one of the most notorious corporate sagas in history. Internorth's evolution was a roller coaster of triumphs and trials. From a growing powerhouse in the energy sector to its fierce battles and strategic mergers, the company became a giant. Meanwhile, in Texas, Houston Natural Gas faced its challenges, navigating market shifts and policy changes. Both companies had their share of successes and setbacks, shaping the landscape of the energy industry as they adapted to changing times. In 1984, Kenneth Lay took over a struggling company called HNG, facing a tough situation. Shortly after, HNG got involved with Internorth and they merged to create Enron in 1985. Enron seemed great, but it had serious problems. Behind its success story were lies, greed, and financial tricks that eventually led to its huge collapse. Internorth's CEO, Sam Segnar, in an attempt to steer the ship through turbulent waters, sought a friendly merger with Houston Natural Gas, HNG. The year was 1985, and the deal went down in history, with Internorth acquiring HNG for a staggering 2.3 billion a whopping 40% higher than the current market price. This union birthed a corporate giant, creating the second largest gas pipeline system in the United States at the time, the North-South Pipelines of Internorth, servicing Iowa and Minnesota, harmonized seamlessly with HNG's East-West Pipeline spanning Florida and California. The corporate landscape shifted as the entity emerged, initially named HNG Internorth Inc., with Internorth technically playing the role of the parent company. The helm was in the hands of Sam Segnar, at least initially, until the board of directors decided to change course, ushering Kenneth Lay into the CEO role. Lay wasted no time relocating the company's headquarters back to Houston and embarking on a quest for a new identity. After spending over $100,000 in focus groups and consultants, the name Enteron was suggested only to be dismissed due to its unfortunate association with intestines. Eventually, the name morphed into the now infamous Enron. Yet Enron's journey was not without hurdles. The merger had its lingering challenges, notably a threat from Erwin Jacobs, demanding over $350 million. Lay, with strategic finesse, sold off segments he deemed incongruent with Enron's long-term vision and consolidated gas pipeline efforts under the Enron Gas Pipeline Operating Company. Enter Jeffrey Skilling, a consultant at McKinsey & Company, with an ingenious concept in 1989. The idea was to link natural gas to consumers in novel ways, the birth of the gas bank. Skilling's success led him to join Enron in 1991 as the head of the gas bank, marking a pivotal moment in the company's evolution. July 1985 marked a pivotal moment as Houston Natural Gas, under the helm of Kenneth Lay, joined forces with Internorth, a Nebraska-based natural gas company. The result? An interstate and interstate natural gas pipeline boasting an impressive 37,000 miles. Lay was appointed chairman and chief executive, and the amalgamated entity was christened Enron. Enron's move to Houston in 1986 with Ken Lay at the forefront signaled a broader vision to become the premier natural gas pipeline in America. However, the road ahead was not without obstacles. In 1987, Enron Oil reported an apparent loss of $85 million, concealing the true figures until 1993. Two top executives faced legal repercussions, underscoring the turbulent times. The Gas Bank Initiative, launched in 1989 and later spearheaded by CEO Jeff Skilling, allowed gas producers and buyers to purchase supplies while hedging price risks. 
Enron's ambition to expand its natural gas business abroad took root. As the gas bank concept evolved into the Enron Finance Corp., the company delved into trading futures and options on the New York Mercantile Exchange. Enter Jeff Skilling, Ken Lay, and Rich Kinder, hiring talents like Andrew Fasto, who played a pivotal role in forming off-balance sheet partnerships. Yet, the shadows were lengthening. Off-balance sheet partnerships, conceived with legitimate intentions, eventually became a tool to hide money-losing ventures and expedite income reporting. The stage was set for the financial saga that would unravel over the coming years. Picture this. In August 2000, Enron's stock price soared to an impressive $90.56 stocks. It was a pinnacle, a zenith that masked the hidden losses lurking behind the scenes. Unbeknownst to the general public and Enron's trusting investors, a storm was brewing within the company. In March 2001, an article by Bethany McLean in Fortune magazine questioned the company's opaque financial practices and the true value of Enron stock. The unraveling had begun, but many investors, still swayed by Lay's charismatic assurances, held on, convinced that Enron would continue to rule the market. By August 15, 2001, Enron's stock had plummeted to $42. The once mighty empire was now showing its vulnerabilities. Yet a loyal cohort of investors clung to hope, buying and retaining their stocks as Lay's promises echoed in their ears. As October rolled in, the stock further nosedived to 15 dollar, presenting what some saw as a golden opportunity, a chance to buy Enron at a discount based on Lay's persistent media optimism. Lay himself, Facing accusations of selling over 70 million worth of stock to repay cash advances, continued to paint a rosy picture to the public. Even his wife, Linda, joined the fray, selling Enron shares worth 1.2 million on November 28, 2001, a move that would soon become part of a larger narrative of financial unraveling. But the storm was about to hit. News of Enron's hidden losses broke on that fateful November morning. Mrs. Lay's well-timed stock sale between 10 Rao and 10.20 a.m. would prove to be an unwitting precursor to the collapse. Enron's stock, once a symbol of corporate might, soon plunged to less than a dollar. The fallout was catastrophic. Paula Reeker, a former Enron executive, faced charges of criminal insider trading for selling stock a week before the public learned about the massive $102 million loss. The domino effect continued as Enron's external auditor, Anderson LLP, crumbled. Fasto, another key player in the web of deceit, faced six years behind bars. Lou Pai, implicated in the financial saga, settled out of court for $31.5 million. Fast forward to December 2, 2001, a day etched in financial history. Enron, once a juggernaut, declared bankruptcy, sending shockwaves through the financial world. The shares that once stood tall at $90.75 were reduced to a mere zero ball 26, a staggering fall from grace. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this content, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more. Oh.